Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let us uh, call one another to the act and attitude of worship. Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life that God has given us and give thanks for Christ's presence in our midst. Thanks be to God, for through the Lord, the present holds new meaning and the future is bright with hope. Rejoice, people of God. Bow your heads before the one who is our wisdom and our strength. We come before God with praise and singing, and we pray that we might be touched and cleansed by the power of God's Spirit. Rejoice, people of God. Rejoice, give thanks, and sing. Amen. For those who are able, please stand and let's sing together hymn number 453 in your hymnal. And you may be seated, friends. Good morning, one and all, and welcome on this seventh Sunday after Epiphany, February the 20th, to our service of worship here at East Congregational United Church of Christ in Concord, New Hampshire. It is wonderful to have you all here. Thank you all for coming out in the latest installment of the Whiplash series of weather events uh, we have had here uh, in, in, in New Hampshire over the past uh, uh, few days. It is great to have you here in the sanctuary, so I welcome you all here. I would like also to welcome all of you uh, from our extended church family who have joined us online via Facebook Live. We are together from wherever we are, friends. We are together to worship the Lord in spirit and truth 
young and old, men, women, and children, all of God's people giving thanks and praise to the Lord. It is in that spirit that I would invite you to join me now in prayer. It is printed, as always, in the bulletin. God of all time and no time, we gather on this Sabbath day to worship you, to remember the story of your faithfulness throughout all generations, and to celebrate our own awakening to new life in Christ. This morning, we sing out the new song you have placed upon our lips, a song of gratitude and praise for your goodness and loving kindness, your compassion and salvation to us and to all humankind. With thanksgiving, we give this time back to you, O God, you who gives to us life and breath day by day. May we worship, be pleasing to you, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Gracious and almighty, ever-present, ever-living, ever-loving God, we are glad to come into your presence today in this sanctuary. Very glad that together, here and, and remotely, we can sing your praises and, and renew ourselves as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so be with us this morning. Inspire us, guide us, prod us if we need a bit of prodding. And hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. And we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15, where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of the Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on this earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to the Pharaoh the Lord of all his house and ruler over all of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. 
You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks and your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. For he, then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. While Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him.
Today's gospel reading is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Love for your enemies. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put onto your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you give back. So ends the reading. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, choir. And will you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You who are and continue to be today, tomorrow, from season to changing season, from age to age the same, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is, for my money, one of the great scenes of the Old Testament. And by the way, uh, it has a special place in my heart because it was the focus of my seminary Hebrew reading class back in the fall of 1982. The climax of an epic story in which a mystery is solved, brothers are reunited, and the chickens come home to roost. Love it. Here's the backstory. You heard the conclusion from Cindy this morning. Let me give you a little bit of the backstory. It is the story of Joseph, famous for that coat of many colors that we all heard about in Sunday school, who years before our text for this morning even was uh, a possibility. Joseph had been cast into a pit and sold into slavery by his own brothers in a fit of anger and jealousy, in part due to the aforementioned coat of many colors. But now, thanks to Joseph's ability to interpret dreams, Joseph becomes neither slave nor prisoner, but in fact had risen to become second in command of all of Egypt, essentially Pharaoh's own chief of staff, if you can believe that. This was a position, you see, that included the job of buying and selling grain in anticipation of a great famine on the land, which makes it all the more ironic and all the great for the story that one day Joseph looks up to find that the very brothers, the same brothers who left him for dead so many years before, are now coming to him for the food needed to sustain their lives. How ironic. 
Now, of course, the brothers had no idea at all that this is Joseph. They, they'd long assumed that he was either dead or else someone's slave. But now, in the grand tradition of all great narratives, the truth is about to be real and revealed. And, and I remember back to that Hebrew reading class. We knew this story from Sunday school, but we were leaning forward in great anticipation. How is this going to come out? The question of how this will come about comes down to this. What's Joseph going to do? Now, in the movies, this is what they call the big payoff. The moment in which the hero finally prevails and the villains get what's coming to them. And Joseph, it should be said, has both the motive for vengeance and the power to make it happen. So, we think, why shouldn't he repay his brothers for what they'd done to him? It's certainly what you would expect someone in Joseph's position to do. And moreover, you know, you read this story, you find out what happened, and you think to yourself... That's what the brothers deserve. But what Joseph does do in this moment of truth is something that nobody expects. He cries. And not just moist eyes and a few sniffles either. We're talking what is referred to these days as ugly cries. In fact, as Cindy was reading this, I was reminded, he just keeps on crying. He cries when he sees his brothers. He cries when he sees his youngest brother, Benjamin. He cries about the situation. He cries about everything. In fact, he cried so loudly, so profoundly, so ugly, that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. <laughs> and then, rather to angrily condemn his brothers for what they've done, through his tears, Joseph joyfully starts talking about God. About how God had somehow turned all the evil that had befallen him into something good. Something very good. Joseph essentially says, don't be worried about all of this. Of course, his brothers, their mouths are hanging open, slack-jawed and buggy-eyed, because they could not believe that this was Joseph first of all, and that Joseph was responding to all this the way he was. Don't worry about it, Joseph says. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you have sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve life. It all fits together, says Joseph. God was the one who sent me here, not you. It had nothing to do with the fact that you pushed me into that pit and left me for dead. It had to do with God. And God sent me before Pharaoh and before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So now the whole family can dwell together and, and not in poverty, but can live well even in the midst of the famine. And before you know it, they're all crying. They're all weeping. There's a lot of weeping in the Bible, lest you think otherwise. Be all because in one single, powerful, life-changing moment, love prevailed over anger. Love prevailed over hurt and the need for vengeance. All at once, there's this family that had once been divided and destroyed, but now is restored and unified as one. Disaster becomes celebration. Triumphant music swells up in the background. The scene fades out. Roll the credits. Imagine, if you will, friends, a love so indwelling, so overflowing that it cannot help but touch anyone and everyone that comes into contact with it. Imagine love so abundant that it can be experienced even in the absolute worst of circumstances. Imagine a love so all-encompassing that it can envelop Joseph's forgiveness for his brothers the preservation of a family, and the deliverance of an entire nation in one fell swoop. 
It is what has been referred to as the impossible possibility. But there it is, right there in the story of Joseph and his brothers. And truthfully, it's the same kind of love that's found again and again and again throughout the biblical story. A love that is mitigated in grace. And this is a story that can be found in our stories as well. In fact, I would suggest to you today that such love can be found in whatever possibility we could name here today. That is, love can be found if God is in the midst of it. Because if God is in it, friends, the love of which we speak will be there. Now, while most of us can't claim the experience of having been cast into the pit by seven jealous brothers, although I'm an only child, so what do I know? Nonetheless, in that wonderful old story, we have a truth that rings very clearly for us today, at least in the sense of, of how it feels to experience God's love in such a surprising and overwhelming way. I know it holds true for me, that is. You know the old saying about how the devil is in the details? Well, the older I get, the more I'm discovering that more often than not, it's been God working in the details of life. Shifting my perceptions of people and situations, prodding me, I used that word earlier on purpose, prodding me to move in ways and directions I have been heretofore reluctant to go, and opening up as I move forward possibilities, the right possibilities, I might add, most usually offering them up long, long before I'm ready to acknowledge them. The point is here is that, ready or not, like it or not, God is always there. And though my humanity might well fight God's relentless divinity to me from time to time, more often than not, in fact, I can also tell you that I am always the better for God's persistence in the matter. And I know I'm not alone in this understanding, right? As a pastor, I bear witness to God's work, God's persistent work on a daily basis. And I dare say that at, at nearly every hospital bedside vigil, back when I was able to do those things, in the midst of every funeral, in the middle of the deepest and the most insurmountable tragedies and conflicts that people have ever had to face in this life, somewhere in all of that, Somehow, there always seems to be the light of God's grace shining through the cracks of sadness, confusion, and grief. I remember a memorial service nearly 30 years ago now that I led for a nine-year-old girl who had passed away from childhood leukemia. It was, I will tell you, one of the hardest funerals I've ever had to do, not simply because this was a child, and that was enough, but also because 30 years ago I had a child that age, and I couldn't even begin to imagine the pain those two parents were going through. In fact, to tell you the truth, after days of trying to work out a eulogy, 10 minutes before the service was to begin, I had nothing, nothing on paper at least, nothing I felt that I was going to be able to say that had any real meaning at all. And uh, as you might well imagine, I was starting to panic, a feeling that only intensified when I discovered that our church sanctuary was now filled to overflowing with family members, friends, and a great many young children, most of whom who were at a funeral service for the very first time. Oh, great, I thought. 
Now what am I going to do? Well, it happened that one request that the family had made was that we play a tape of some music that the little girl loved, a song from the cartoon movie of that era, An American Tale. Remember that one? That was, if you remember the story, of Fievel the Immigrant Mouse, separated from his mother in old New York. Very well done movie. Steven Spielberg was involved in it, as I recall. And the song that was at the center of this film was a song called Somewhere Out There. Somewhere out there, someone waits for me. You remember the song. They still play it on the radio. It's a song about how true love transcends even the farthest of distances. I know it is a sad song to begin with. And we weren't even playing the Linda Ronstadt version, friends. We were playing the version directly from the film with a little mouse singing into the moonlight. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> and it was really emotional. Everyone is crying, as you would expect. And so were all these children. But as I looked out on the congregation, I noticed something else. All these kids, they're all singing along with the record. Singing, or at least mouthing every word of love and caring and hope. Every one of them channeling Bible the Mouse and and the music is touching their hearts in a way that nothing else could at that particular moment. It was, at the very least, a holy moment. And I was bearing witness to it. And after it was all done, I stood up in my pulpit and began my eulogy. And I will tell you today, I don't remember at all what it was I said. I can tell you it wasn't on the paper. All I can tell you is that by some miracle of grace, the words came very easily. And I realized almost immediately God was in it. God was working in the details of the profound sadness of that day and the grief shared by family, friends, and a room full of third graders, not to mention one very blocked pastor. What I do remember, though, and what I can tell you today is that a few days after the service, one of our deacons had been over into the sanctuary. We had two different buildings, and they came over from the church and brought to me a pew card that they had found there in the pew with a note written in a child's handwriting. It read simply, I feel better now. Love, Julie. Amazing. If God is in it, you see, the impossible possibilities become not only possible, but they become real. The strength and peace we need becomes ours. And unlikely as it's going to seem at that moment, something good, something healing, and something brimming with hope is going to be found in the midst of it. Now, this is the truth that can be found at the heart of this morning's gospel reading. Those wonderful Ideal, wonderfully idealistic but seemingly impossible commands that we are to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse and pray for those who abuse us. Do not judge, we heard Cindy read to us from, from Luke, and you will not be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And I have to say that as Cindy was reading those words today, I'm thinking, boy, wouldn't this be a great world um, if that were the case always? And, and truly, these verses are very basic to our understanding of the Christian faith. But here is the bottom line. It's hard. Very, very hard standard, almost an impossible standard to live up to. Truth is, is that our human nature inevitably runs counter to Christ's teachings. Let me tell you, that's something I think we all know, but that particular passage from Luke really brings it home. Actually, i got to tell you, I'm reminded here of a lyric from a 
great Lyle Lovett song, and I don't know if I'm quoting it verbatim, but it gets the point across. Lyle sings in the song, God can, but I can't. And that's the difference between God and me. (laughs) I love it. But maybe, you know, that's the whole point, right? We can't do what God would have us do or to be to one another on our own as we should, given our own human frailty and our own propensity to sin. That always seems to get in the way. But if God is in it, the love that's required for forgiveness and mercy and non-judgment and all the rest of it can and will be poured out to overflowing. There's a Canadian pastor and writer by the name of Vicki Holmes, and she has written, agape love, that is love that is full and self-sacrificial, and the kind of love to which you and I are called, is difficult. That is why, she said, Joseph had to place the situation with his brothers in God's hands. And that is why we have to take this business of truly loving one another as we should, of doing unto others as they would, we would have them do unto us, that we have to take it to the hands of God. All of that which Jesus talks about in Luke, all of which we are taught in faith, has to be put in the hands of God if we are to fulfill that call. We need, Holmes writes, to pray for God's leading in this, Pray for God's wisdom. Pray for God's love that will spill over and over so that it will pour out to all those who need it. This is part and parcel of the Christian life. You know that. We all know that. And honestly, I think we all know down, deep down within ourselves that what it takes for us to love in the manner that Christ demands. It's simply that God has to be in the midst of it. For you and I to be capable of mastering the impossibilities, as it were, we need God to be in the details of it, working in and through us so that truly the measure we give will be the measure we get back. Every time I hear that read in Scripture, I'm thinking, boy, that's a good line. The measure we give will be the measure we get back. I mean, who knows the kind of challenges you and I are going to have to face this week. In truth, our lives are filled with unexpected moments of truth in which, like Joseph in our story today, we are kind of, we are not kind of, we are confronted with the kind of circumstances that demand from us a response. And the question is, it always is, how are we going to respond? An unforeseen piece of bad news changes everything. A moral or ethical dilemma suddenly rears its ugly head. A breach of trust, a crisis of faith that rocks our world to its very core. I mean, who knows how love and compassion and forgiveness and mercy and grace is going to figure into the decisions we are going to have to make. How are these virtues of faith that we have been taught from the time we were little kids actually, might actually apply for the facing of this hour right now? And if it does, how do we know we can follow through? Even with something as simple and as universal as doing unto others, as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. Well, maybe as Mr. Lovett has suggested, we can. At least not wholly or primarily by our own efforts. It's not to say that we don't make an effort sometimes, but maybe we can't do everything that we need to do. God can. And the good news, it is that precisely within our own human weakness and fallibility that God's love and mercy begins to flow, working in and through the details of every new day. 
every relationship, every unforeseen circumstances, every circumstance that we know we're going to have to hit head on, everything that happens that girds us to do the right thing with mercy, forgiveness, with justice, and always, always with love. Because if God is in it, if God is working with us in it, whatever it is, something good is going to come out of it. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. And we are going to sing Trust and Obey. That is hymn 556 in the hymn. Let's sing unto the Lord. And you may be seated, friends. I heard it said once again the other day, and I've heard it oft times this, about this time of year every year, there's a reason that February is the shortest month. <laughs> it has to do with the weather. It has to do, especially here in New England, with uh, the temperatures going from record high to record low in, in a 24-hour period. It has to do with even though uh, the days are getting longer, it's still very dark and foreboding, and it just seems to be the depth of a winter, which brings out 
all sorts of hardship for us. And boy, you know, it may not go a full 31 days, but boy, am I glad it, it doesn't. And we're into March and spring finally. And I'm very much aware of this. Uh, I recognize this in, in, in my own life, in the life of the people I love, and I recognize it in the life of the church. There's been a lot going on, some very, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, obvious, others that are uh, down deep inside. It's a hard time of year. And I think that's one of the very good reasons that we should come together to pray, uh, to f seek God's presence and power in the midst of even the darkest of circumstances, to see light growing, to see springtime come and the renewal of life. And of course, all of this coincides, of course, in a, in a, in a couple of weeks with the season of Lent beginning and eventually coming to the cross and to the new life of Easter. It, it all seems to come together in such a great way. So as we pray today, let's pray for ourselves if we are going through a bit of that darkness right now. Let's pray for all those around us who we are know are going through things in this very short but intense month of February. I uh, just want to lift up just a few, very quickly if I can, some uh, prayer concerns for you. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Lee Walls. Lee underwent surgery earlier this week to have a pacemaker put in. It went very well, and she was there overnight, came home. But I heard from Mike this morning, and she is back in the hospital having some pain. Uh, they're not sure what it is. Everything is working right, and she is going to be uh, uh, well, we're convinced. But uh, also, uh, they, they're not sure exactly what's happening, so they've got to get to the bottom of that. So our prayers uh, continue with Lee uh, in the hospital, also with Mike, and uh, for her swift recovery, her, re her quick return home as well. I uh, want to uh, offer up a prayer uh, for family members uh, of, De of Deb Monson. Uh, first off, she has a, a brother-in-law who is, uh, after many years, having to make the transition to assisted living, and that's been a very difficult thing for him and for his wife, your sister, and uh, uh, so our prayers uh, go with his name. You told me was Bob, too, it's right? Bob, yeah. Another Bob. And, and uh, we'll, we'll pray for Bob that uh, this transition will be a good one. He's going to be in the same facility where his mother is. And uh, mother-in-law mother is, I'm sorry. And, and uh, so uh, it's a difficult transition. I know that personally. And uh, so uh, uh, we will pray for him. And we're also going to be praying for your husband, Bob. He has had a, a, a few uh, medical issues this week. You have been in and out of the emergency room. All seems to be well, and in fact, uh, and we're, we're praying hard for that to continue because uh, uh, Bob and Deb are getting on a plane and flying to Southern California uh, for a little vacation this week. San Diego, beautiful city, and I, and I was told today somebody said it's very hot there, so viva la heat uh, right now. <laughs> Pour it on you, there you go. So uh, our prayer is with Bob and Thank give him our best and be safe and have a good time. We are going to continue to pray for Ann Woodman, who is still recovering from her hip surgery of a couple weeks ago, doing a little bit better day by day. And uh, uh, she's it's got to kind of stay off the stairs and stay uh, at home and, and, and stay safe. But every day that passes, she's getting a little bit better. So we pray for her. I want to also offer up a prayer for Kathy Radel, who uh, shared with us this week. She has, deals with an awful lot of chronic pain, and it is very profound right about now. So our prayers to Kathy. George, please give her our best when, when you talk to her. And uh, uh, we're praying for some relief from her. And Reva Asneev's daughter, Jamie, is out of the hospital. Uh, she was at, in a hospital in Massachusetts, but she's home with the proper medication and treatment and uh, doing a little bit better day by day as well. So we pray for Jamie as well. And we, as we have been lifting up, we have many of our, uh, our shut-ins, including Yvonne Crocker, Allison Cullen, Sally Gibbs, the Reverend Alden and Carol Ann Blake, for Maxine Brewster, for Ray Edmonds, uh, so many others that I could name. So we pray for them and we pray for the caregivers all around them as they uh, uh, seek to live out their days with, with some measure of goodness and joy. All right, uh, quickly, are there anyone else that has a prayer request today to add? All right, 
Well, I'm glad that we can all pray together, so let us do so right now. Let's pray. We just sang the words, trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And, oh God, it is true that sometimes we stumble on those words. Trusting is hard enough, but to obey your word, to do as you have asked us and called us to be, sometimes that just feels very impossible. But, oh God, we know what comes in trusting you and following your lead. We do find that something good comes out even in the the worst of circumstances. And so we pray today, O God of life and love and strength and hope, that you would help us to trust in your presence and power in every situation. Help us to know, O God, though we may be sick, though we may be uncertain, though we may be incredibly confused at the circumstances of our lives, that you are there with love, with power, guiding us, holding us back at times, pushing us forward in others, and giving us the the modicum of strength we need for the facing of whatever situation has come our way. Help us, O God, to trust you much more than we ever have. Help us that your love will help us in forming our words, in deciding a course of action, to finding the compassion and the caring perhaps that we have been unwilling to give, to cultivate a spirit of forgiveness in our hearts and to work in ways that will help others forgive us. Help us, O God. It's such a familiar phrase, but we need your help. Help us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And help us to love as you have loved. May that apply to us as your people in these pews, to those who are listening to us in their homes online, to us as a whole church, to us as a community, a nation, and truly as the world. And, O God, we pray as so much seems to be on the brink of war and disaster in the Ukraine and in other places across the world. Help us to live and to walk in the ways of your whole peace, your shalom. For we know if you are in it, and if we follow your lead, we will walk as you would have us walk. Help us to trust and obey, O Lord, and we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, friends, that does bring us pretty much to the close of this service of worship here at East Congregational Church once again. I am glad that you are of all with us this morning, our regulars and visitors, and I'm glad uh, and thank you all who are with us online. It just continually is a source of amazement to me of who finds us online. And uh, uh, we are a church wherever we are. And that, I think, holds us through all the uncertainties of life because we know whatever happens around here, God is in it. And uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Kay reminded me this morning that uh, it's only like six months away from our next yard sale. Maybe even closer. Maybe even closer. Who knows? There's a little sign and a tiny little box out in the fellowship halls that said that now is a very good time to start sorting through things, uh, maybe to donate to the yard sale. You know, there's another reason February is the shortest month. You know, it gives us the opportunity to do some cleaning out. And And she can second that. Many, many trips. (laughs) 
I have said, and I, I will speak on Kathy's behalf, I, I, there is very rarely a time that she doesn't come in here when she hasn't got something for the next yard sale. So that little box is going to fill up very quickly, but we will find places for anything you would like to bring. I can get more boxes. She can get more boxes. There we go. That's coming up, so be aware of that. And also, as we've been telling you all throughout these uh, many weeks of winter, we did postpone our annual meeting, but that is coming up, March the 13th. And uh, uh, we are... Uh, looking forward to the season of Lent to make our journey together to the cross. We're going to have an Ash Wednesday gathering here, which is a week from this coming Wednesday. So we'll tell you more about that uh, in the days to come and things that we're going to do, uh, special things that we're going to do during the Lenten season. So we'll be watching for that as well. Any other announcements this morning? All right, then let's close. By singing of God's peace, the hymn is Shalom to you now. That is 436 in the hymnal. desperation to the daybreak of joy to God be all power and authority forever and ever and ever amen, amen. go in peace dear friends we'll see you soon amen, amen.